Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. The Uncommon Good is on the air, and I'm Bud Marr. Oh, wow. It's always tempting at the start of the show to, like, throw a curveball. You want to just do the replication stuff and see if if you're just saying exactly what I do. That I'll saying exactly out. what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's always funnier in my own mind than it probably is for listeners. As clearly stated, I'm Bo Bonner, uh, Senior Advisor for Mission Initiatives here at Mercy College of Health Sciences and also the Director for the Center for Human Flourishing. But what, what, what do you do over at Mercy College? I am the Dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So I, I work with our faculty who teach the general education courses as students prepare for their professional programs. You, you, that's what you should. You should be the general. Ooh, the general I, of education. Me like you, that title. Five stars towards education. This is the Uncommon Good. We're happy to be here with you. As always, thank you, Mercy College, for underwriting the show, mchs.edu. We are not quite to midterm yet. Uh, I know spring break is still to come, but it did warm up, bud, and I think some people got done with some of their first big tests. So it does seem that we are firmly entrenched in the school year here at Mercy. Yeah, a lot of great things going on at Mercy. Uh, besides the warm weather or alongside the warm weather, we've got some exciting spring events. We can mention this maybe at the end of the show, but the uh, research symposium, which is going to touch on uh, healthcare concerns for immigrants and refugees, that's April 8th in the afternoon. Then that same evening, your Center for Human Flourishing is hosting some speakers. So April 8th in Des Moines is going to be an intellectual Volcano. That's where this volcano was coming (laughs) from. Uh, So if you can remember April 8th, begin to put that on your calendars. It will be, I mean, at that point, Easter, right? Yeah, that will be right in the, like, I was going to say wake of Easter. That doesn't sound quite right. Easter tide. April 7th is Easter, so. You guys are going to want to come celebrate with us by having, uh, after you feast on whatever you gave up for Lent, you'll be able to have an intellectual feast as well. It will be perfect. Um, I know that we'll have up details on mchs.edu slash flourish, but I'm sure just mchs.edu will have some of this as well. Once again, thank you, Mercy College, for underwriting the show. Bud, today we're going to sort of do a callback, but with a new lens on it. What I mean by this is we, of course, have talked a lot about our theory of leadership style that we think, in imitation of Jesus Christ, we call it canonic leadership, kenosis, self-emptying. Our good friend, Dr. Kristen Collier, wrote about what she calls dark kenosis in medicine. And I don't say it's a challenge to what we said, but it's certainly a side of the coin that I'm glad she brought up because I didn't think about it. And there's a way to talk about what it means to empty oneself well versus emptying self one uh, self to your detriment, especially when it comes to bringing the light of Christ into whatever field you're doing. She's talking about medicine. And so we're going to talk about that today. This is the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner, Dr. Bud Mars, stick around. We'll be back right after this. Back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. No matter how you choose to do so, be that on the airwaves of Iowa Catholic Radio, all through the state here in Iowa, on iowacatholicradio.com, the Iowa Catholic Radio app, and of course, our wonderful, beautiful, intelligent, dare I say probably tall even, Bud, podcast listeners. I don't know if you're tall or not, <laughs> but thank you so much for listening to the show. Today, we are revisiting something that we'd planned to revisit anyway, maybe in uh, drips and drabs. I'm stealing that from our good friend, Dave Delio, who uses that turn of phrase yeah. all the time. That's up there with your uh, grist for the mill. Oh, yeah. We like- all have sayings. Grist for the mill, and I think you reach for Wolf and Wharf. Yeah, w- w- uh, Warp and Wef. Warp and Wef. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> we're such old men. We have like little <laughs> phrases that are like carved in wood with a pocket knife. I think you gave that your own fling, though. It's Warp and Weft, man. Okay. <laughs> what do you think? I'm going to do, do some search while you're talking. You think <laughs> it has to do with wolves? No, no, that- no. Like <laughs> dogs barking. <laughs> Inside you, there are two wolves. Uh, okay. Wow, that was already awesome. Sorry, we should just do that. Like, go through every friend we have and, and what old man saying they have. Warp and woof, is that what you're saying? There's and weft. Like, 
Let's. Uh, there might be very. There's weft. I, <laughs> any rate. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the point that we're getting at is <laughs> beyond the fact that we're hoping to start reapproaching. Uh, if people remember back when we had a thirty-minute show, I think that was twenty twenty-two. We pretty much dedicated all those shows yeah. to a theory of leadership we were working out. We're hoping to still work out and get published and things like this. So we're going to try to reapproach that with like two years under our belt, but of probably actually factually dealing with leadership more than we even had at that point. And so we're going to start easing into this. I think we kind of thought we would do it here pretty soon, but our good friend, Dr. Kristen Collier, she's been on the show before. I've had the great honor to write an article with her and been, uh, uh, been able to speak on a panel with her at the Notre Dame Ethics Conference, mostly about John Henry Newman, education and medicine. Well, she wrote a really interesting article uh, just a few days ago in the Public Discourse, the Journal of the Witherspoon, Witherspoon Institute, The Dark Kenosis of Medical Education. Now, but I would say we can talk about this first. When we talk about kenosis, and she's, she's using the word in the same way, can you tell the listeners what, in the Greek, very technically, what that word kenosis means? Yeah, so kenosis has to do with emptying, and the way it applies to our faith is that when we talk about our Lord, uh, we say that he had this self-emptying, this, um, well, in the Greek, kenosis. We've quoted this passage on air before, but when you look at like Philippians 2, it talks about Christ emptying himself. Now, um, there's some technical theological conversations that have crept up around this. So some theologians have asked if Christ was fully divine, why in the gospels does he not seem to know certain things? So for instance, uh, when the hemorrhaging woman who's healed, when she touches the hem of his garment, he asked the question, who touched me? I mentioned on the show last week, funny enough that, um, he says at one point that not even the son of man knows that the, the day that the father has appointed for you know, the end of history in a nutshell. Um, And so there's, there's knowledge that he seems not to know. And then beyond that, you know, the gospel say at one point that he grew in stature and truth. So the way that theologians have wrestled with this mystery is they're saying that part of the self emptying of Christ is almost like an emptying of knowledge that he would have as omniscient God. I think in Philippians two, the key that's given to it is more so about the humility that our Lord demonstrated in um, the, the passage says he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, becoming a servant or slave, even to the point of dying on a cross. And so for St. Paul, that kenosis really gets at the at the idea of Christ self-emptying in the sense of humility and then taking on even an ignominious death. Absolutely. And theologically, we'll get into this, why it's so important that Christ was able to do this and Christ does this first. Suffice it to say, in our discussions of leadership, kenosis, we're giving it an A+, plus, right? Mm-hmm. It is very much an akya where we want you to be a kenotic leader. And precisely, I, I mean, again, we're going to talk about all these things, and you can go back and listen to them on our podcast. Um, but I will say this, that for us, it was something that we thought leaders who wanted to call themselves Catholic leaders and make a commitment to imitating Christ— was a positive thing to do. Now, inherent in that, we talk a lot about negativity and negation and the via negativa. So even when we're talking about it as something leaders should do, it is about pouring yourself out, emptying yourself, getting out of others' way, even as a leader. We talked about the nuance about not being a doormat and things like this, but very much we were trying to advocate for people to take on kenosis when it comes to leadership. Kristen is not, first of all, let me point out, she doesn't cite our work and say, look at these idiots, right? She doesn't, uh, she's not bashing us or anything like this. What she wants to point out is as someone who works, so someone who works in medical education, she works at Michigan Medical School, and not only just there, so she's not picking on her place of employment, but in medicine in general, She goes, there is an assumption that even though, as she says at the beginning um, of her work, despite the lip service given to the, quote, all are welcome ethos of medical education, the culture of the medical profession typically implies that there's actually a very narrow set of, quote, acceptable anthropological perspectives that a physician can have 
and that you had better get in line or risk being ostracized in a profession that is still so hierarchical and dependent on subjective measures for advancement, the pressure to fit in and subjugate oneself to established norms can be powerful. First of all, shots fired out of the first par- paragraph. But what she goes on to say is there's an expectation, especially for religious people, and maybe even doubly so for Christians, that they must empty themselves of their foundational anthropologies, not when they sort of go into the patient's room to make sure that they're not being paternalistic or assuming what the patient wants. This is not a matter of them being making a, you know, sort of nitpicking about the idea of patient autonomy and some of the things we've yeah. brought up with bioethics. What she's saying is sociologically, there is an expectation that before you begin medical education itself, that you would empty yourself of your foundational commitments particularly in the anthropological realm, which, of course, is going to be a big deal for Christians for whom which Christian anthropology is such a central aspect of the horizon and view of of not only ethics but just life in Christ, that you must have what she calls this dark kenosis before you can even begin medical education in the acceptable way or face ostracism. And it's very, now I I even told Kristen myself, I'd even, I'd maybe call it like inverted kenosis or even maybe a perversion of what kenosis was in Christian um, theology. But in your introduction, I think you did a good job of pointing out it's not like it's completely settled uh, in, in Christian notions. There's different ways that it relates. But certainly I told Kristen the highest praise that I have for this is I'm kicking myself that we didn't think about it, bud, when we were going around loudly talking about kenosis. This is not an argument against what we have to say. It's not like she wrote an article that disproves what she says, but it is a very wonderful challenge to what we say for several reasons. But one starts with, if this is true about education where people are asked to sort of Divulge, you know, divulge their commitments before they learn. Is that what we're saying about leaders? Are we accidentally on Team Dark Kenosis, bud? It was a very thought-provoking article, and I think she's right that there's probably good forms of kenosis and then negative ways this works itself out. Not surprisingly, I couldn't help but think of St. John Henry Newman when I read this essay. He, uh, when he writes about university life, He talks about how when you try to bracket certain fields like theology and philosophy, what ends up happening is not that the institution becomes more rational, but that those topics continue to be addressed. They're just often done very poorly. So you create this sort of like subject vacuum. And then inevitably these questions come up, the things that philosophy addresses. And now you have those who just aren't trained in those fields kind of answering those questions poorly. A lot of this relates back to just a a cultural direction in our uh, country, you could say in the West more generally, where we've got this idea that you're more reasonable or rational to the extent that you're not committed to prior traditions or inherited traditions. Mm -hmm. And besides Newman, like I think another person that we could bring into the conversation is uh, Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI. He gave this address. I can't remember the exact year. It was during his pontificate called the Regensburg Address. I think it's really one of the most important public addresses by a Pope in recent memory. Unfortunately, the commentary got bogged down by, he quotes an emperor who was critical of some facets of Islam. And that's sort of what the media seized on. But in that message, there's something that Pope Benedict says that has always stuck with me. And that is, you know, science became so revered in our culture because of its explanatory power. It's, it's an impressive field of inquiry. And through science, we've created things like planes that fly and atom bombs and we can you know, we can travel from here to there very very rapidly and so we see the world around us and we have these conveniences and these technological advancements and they're all created by science and Ratzinger Pope Benedict says because of that we sort of revere science it has the place that maybe religion used to have in cultures but he said science has attained what it's been able to attain by limited limiting itself so when you think about scientific inquiry it brackets certain questions and it says like, we're going to get down to the way that things work, not ask questions like, why are there, why are they there? You know, sort of like these deeper philosophical questions. And, and, and Pope Benedict said, 
that leads to a bad place where there are very important conversations that we have to have conversations. And I mean, not necessarily explicitly theological, but about justice, about love, et cetera, that science, because it is intrinsically self-limiting can't answer or can only do so poorly. Now that's not to present things as like a God in the gaps theology, but just to say what, what happens is like, again, you have this void where it's like, well, we're going to, we're going to do away with metaphysics. We don't need it anymore. And then you just have a bad metaphysics. And I, I see that happening in the medical field where there's, there are these anthropological assumptions, but they're just sort of like the idea is like, well, no, we don't have those because we've, we've set aside tradition. We're just purely rational now. So the conversation's being done poorly or people are being left out of it. And we have to recover like a more robust sense of, of how we do those things. No, I think it's important, just as you say, that because science, and again, a very loaded word, but we're calling science now, what used to be called natural philosophy, which itself was just a big part of the contested intellectual culture of the 16th through 19th centuries in many ways, it got to where it got the power that it has, like you said, by limiting itself, even just philosophically to what classical philosophy would call the efficient material cause. So the material used in processes and then the efficient causes that give context to how they come about and how they would proceed. What would classically be called either formal cause or final cause, which that's where theology, of course, would have a lot to say, but philosophy in general, typically science on purpose limits those. There's some ways that they sneak in some aspects of formal, formal cause, you know, probably a little bit complicated by how math, how it ends up being a driving part of physics works and all this. So I don't want to act like I'm shortchanging these things or that answers everything. But certainly, as you said, there is a canonic element, even at the beginning of modern science, where it says we will empty ourselves of certain concerns yeah. in order to be able to pay attention to very particular concerns that we can have manipulable statistical control over our observational um, control over the writer Terry Eagleton has a funny line about this and I can't deliver it like he does, but he says like, as a scientist is doing experiments, like she can't be awing and wonder like every 10 seconds, right? Like right. you kind of have to set aside the why questions as you're seeking to understand the efficient and material causes. So in a way to make this work and work as like, as we've pointed out, work extremely well is a canonic exercise to say we won't, we will empty ourselves from what in some ways are the most basic concerns of human life. Why, right? And we will set them aside for the power of the how, which we can, which we can observe better and then manipulate and, and use, right? So the utility, the techne, which again, none of this has to be like evil bad guys making a big decision. In fact, I, I would say, but it's because of probably the Christian Western idea that we're getting ready to, you know, delve into with Lent, that I'm going to give up some good things for the sake of really illuminating particular other good things, right? Mm-hmm. There's a way in which you can think of the scientific method. I'm sure most scientists won't enjoy this, but some might, that it's actually penance, right? Like, so penitentially, as it were, we don't immediately in this moment look at final and, and formal cause. And in that penitential moment, we're going to as, allow ourselves to self-empty those concerns to really let these these ones before us shine in some ways to let the materiality of the world and its efficiency shine and forth the problem right is to think that that is drives all things and this is where i start to see the cultural reasons that modern medical education perhaps and this shows up in all sorts of places like politics for instance too and 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 actually racism and it's all connected Whenever you start to get people advocating a neutrality or an empty signifier, which let's be honest, like the word white is in racial discussions, where it doesn't really mean anything except that you're the one thing not grounded in a particularity, that is this false kenosis, right? Where you, you act like you aren't grounded somewhere. You act like you float above the fray so that you're able to make these sort of judgments that can then go unquestioned. And so what I mean by this is a lot of times when they're like, okay, you need to empty yourselves of your prior metaphysical anthropological commitments when you come to medical education, usually what they're trying to say is, 
you know, because you need to learn stuff, right? Like, so don't be too proud to realize you got to learn new things or it's for the sake of maybe the patient, right? Oh, you need to empty yourselves of your concerns because you really need to be concerned for the patient. What goes unstated, though, is you need to empty yourself so that you can have the, the unstated concern of the most dominant part of the culture. And to your point, right, science, the liberal enlightenment, that sort of idea of rationality is religious, even if it's not a religion. And so, of course, one way you can get rid of an opposing religion is to fight it absolutely. But another is to say, oh, you can have your gods somewhere else, but when you're in the most important parts of our culture, the public sphere, medicine, education, there's only room for one religion, ours, yeah. which is the sort of pluralistic, above the fray, empty signifier idea of the liberal enlightenment nation state. This goes for medicine, this goes for education, this goes for politics, etc. I think I'm channeling the philosopher Charles Taylor here, and I don't want to get too far afield, but I think that last comment that you just made, it's so much in front of our faces that sometimes we look past it. It's sort of the water that we swim in. But even the terminology religion has a history and something's at stake. So when I say I'm channeling Charles Taylor, I think in one of his books, he talks about the the, the British colonizing India. Mm -hmm. And Hindus in India were resistant to the British notion that they were practicing a religion because yeah. for them, their, their daily practice, it was their way of life. And they, they recognized that when, when the English came and, you know, sort of like subjugated them, that the naming of religion was this idea was like, it had, it was tradition dependent. And there was this notion in English culture that religion is something that you do on the side. It's not, the wolf and wharf of everyday life. Oh, <laughs> you know, hey, that, real yeah. quick, bud. No, I found both online. <laughs> what it turns out is I'm a weaver. When it, yeah. Cause like warp and weft has to do with weaving cloth together. I think warp and weft sounds cooler. So I'm going to go with that, but we've, <laughs> I, I mean, in America, like we've kind of given up the game because we settle into that notion. So we practice religion. Whereas like religio, even for like St. Thomas Aquinas, it was, the the practices that tie people together. And so it's not like there's this sphere where you do like taxes and fight wars and govern. And that's sort of like the hard nosed facts of life. And then religion is like a hobby that you have on the side. So there's something at stake. I think that question about neutrality, we talk about this with students all, all the time. Like that's one of, that's what's sort of one of the great lies that we fall for. And it really leads to a place where, we, we can give up a lot of like the radicality of our faith by falling into that trap. And it's interesting that it starts to be an intellectual commitment strung through a lot of what quote unquote modernity and post-modernity cares about, which is that if you can somehow, un I mean, and, and when people react sort of with relativism, they think they're reacting against the ancient world, but they're really re reacting against a modernity that has invented something that most, even when you think your commitment is universally true for all people, like Christians have since the beginning of their existence, they didn't believe there was this neutral state that if you reached it and attained it, you were above everything else. The situatedness, right? The fact that they believed in an incarnate God, like, Jesus came to this place, and then this apostle passed it on to the next apostle. There's a, there's a floating above it all that acting like you must have this dark kenosis to start out. And I, I see it now with, with Kristen trying to say, like, there's a way you're supposed to empty your mind so it's like a dark room so they can fill it with the light of you know medical education. Um, but the inversion of what Christ is doing. So that, I think, is like the political element when we come back, I think we can really talk about the spirituality of what has to happen with what we're calling the true kenosis of Christ as opposed to this dark kenosis so that we can make a distinction that, again, I don't think we ever would have come up with except for Kristen writing this wonderful work. This is The Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Mars. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Back. 
back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show on the airwaves, online, on the app, or on podcast. It is wonderful to have you with us. We are talking about kenosis, that very central concept to Bud and I's leadership theory that we, like I said, we were able to work out mostly, I think, through 2022. I've been working on that, being able to give talks about it. Bud, you gave another version of this talk um, just in November, for instance. Something very much on our minds, our good friend, Dr. Kristen Collier, who we've said has been on the show before and then also had the chance to work with her in various venues for the public discourse, wrote an interesting article about dark kenosis, as she calls it and pins the name, in medical education. Real quick, the idea, unlike ours, we're trying to say, oh, it's great to be canonic in leadership because you want to imitate Jesus who emptied himself, taking on our form, right? The form of the, the slaves to sin in order to die for us, be resurrected and save us, which is what the Philippian hymn in Philippians 2 is all about. Dr. Collier points out that with medicine, there's this presumption, bud, that before you can really get into medical school at all and learn, yeah. you must empty yourself of prior commitments, particularly metaphysical and anthropological ones, so that you then are illuminated by what the medical school and the sort of medical industry's understanding of its commitments are. And that if you don't do that, that there's a certain ostracization that people face and that she sees this particularly with religious uh, medical students and maybe even doubly so with Christians. So that's what we've been up to talking about in the first uh, segment and let's keep rolling on now. Yeah. I had a quick question. I know you mentioned before we went to break going in a certain direction before we get there. So as I read Kristen's article, I found it very challenging and thought provoking, but the more I chewed on it, the more I started to struggle with how do you resist this sort of trend because I have a feeling like at this point in history, we're fighting what you'd call like a rear guard action. It's almost like our opponents have already set the battle lines and it's tough to know how to outflank them without falling into their trap. So to kind of get at this bow, there's this quote in there that I love, but I think it, I can use this as a launching pad for my question to you. She's, she writes, I would argue that the professional identity an outlook typically expected of our physicians is not only hollow and lacks moral commitments and conviction rooted in God, but is akin to our becoming like machines. Machines have no divine anthropology. They have no memory of God. Machines exist only in the present without any comprehension of what it means to be a very human being. By their nature, machines are not humans, but things. Whereas medicine historically or should take care of persons, Yet modern medicine is becoming infatuated with things, machines, AI, and other non-human objects, all while allegedly in the service of caring for human beings. So I think Kristen does an amazing diagnosis there. Like she really just hits it on the head. And when I started to say like, man, that, that's terrible. Like that almost gave me the heebie-jeebies. I want to fight back against this. But the problem is when I started to think about like, how are we going to strategically work against this? And the thoughts that started to come to mind to me we're sort of like trying to prove the merits of our own approach. So it's like, well, I was going to say so many of our patients, especially in the future are going to be coming from places where they do practice faith and where they do have these commitments where it's like they, they have a divine anthropology or even beyond that, you know, being like we talk, our culture values like cultural sensitivity. And so if your patients are coming from places where they're persons of faith or, you know, they, they don't want to reduce human beings to machines. But then as I started to, as I started to move to those arguments, I'm thinking to myself, am I just sort of giving this kind of pragmatic sort of yeah. like almost like hospitals, like their reimbursements sometimes are tied to like patient satisfaction. Oh yeah. And by falling into that trap, am I saying like I, an approach that values faith is only valuable to the extent that it leads to positive patient outcomes. Right. <laughs> You're what is wrong with being robotic and medicine bad? It's, a, it's sort of like, please press the religion button you would like me to. Yeah, that would be terrible. Why'd you do that? But no. <laughs> I, it's, it's, no, this is a good point. We could do an entire show on this point, but I want to very much highlight it to show that Bud and I have poisoned each other's brains with each other's thoughts so thoroughly that this is exactly right. We are always prompted in this battle to respond in their terms. Mm -hmm. Now, two things about that. On one hand, 
at some point, if we learn from Alistair McIntyre, who is sort of behind all of these talks, by the way, we're going to have to eventually put our argument in terms they can hear, right? So this sort of translation that, that, that has to take place. But that's different than your first impulse being, oh, but actually it is useful, which then, like you said, is just playing into, uh, it's just playing into their mode of, of attrition. Because what they're going to say is, well, okay, good. We'll let you around for, for as much as it seems like people are satisfied with your way. But if we find something more satisfying, you're going to hit the road. And then one more time, religion becomes just a sort of narcotic effect. It's one more consumption choice among others which even though the text might not be backing up what they're saying sort of the form in which our argument takes ultimately says all there is is utilitarianism and consequences and choices so brilliant point and move noticing this bud i actually think what i was hoping to move on to next is exactly the sort of wrench we have to throw into this machine so how do you mess up machines? Well, you you throw wrenches into them. Does that ever, ever actually ever happen, bud? I don't know. But we're talking about turns of phrase at the beginning of the show. That's one of mine. Throw the wrench into the machine. So uh, how do we throw a wrench into this machine? Well, part of it, like you said, is refusing <laughs> to look at our arguments and people like machines. So it's important to say, even if... It is positive, like we have positive sort of survey information that shows people like being talked to spiritually. That can't be enough for us, one. Two, this is where I think our arguments go back to say something like with John Henry Newman that how you treat things like knowledge or knowing things, if there's never a point where you just know things for their own sake and you love them for their own sake, if all knowledge is just as you is just measured by its use as a tool, then we're going to eventually think of our, our patients as tools. We're going to think of doctors as tools. It's, it's a race to the bottom. And so there has to be places of resistance where we say, for instance, it's just good to learn even if you do nothing with it. Yeah. And in medicine, right, it's just good to be with people even if we don't ultimately heal them which is why in medicine i always get really worried people acting like we need to go for the gusto and figure out how to like let no one die so you know ground shifting saying medicine's not about keeping people alive mm -hmm. it's about healing and we need to define that healing is different than mere life saving so some of the the themes bud you and i have hit in class some of our podcasts but this goes back to kenosis what, we're, what, what Kristen calls dark kenosis, what I was throwing out as maybe nega or bizarro or inverted kenosis, is instead of saying the point is to clear yourself out just so you can be indoctrinated, and but let's be honest, we have hit on this when we've taught sacrificial leadership, because what, you know, people go, it sounds like what you want us to be is doormats. And so how do you be canonic? How do you empty yourself as a leader, but not just get pushed around? So before we go beyond that, what were some of the things that we tried to get students to think of to say we wanted them to be servant or, nay, sacrificial leaders, but not doormats? Well, we pointed them in a lot of ways to the example of Jesus Christ. And this kind of, this is one area, you know, when we read scripture, a lot of times like preachers or other scholars will challenge us to pay attention to the context. And I think there are a lot of accounts of Jesus preaching and teaching where we've read the stories for so long and they've been kind of filtered through our culture that we don't realize what precisely is taking place back then. And so, for instance, like a prominent example that I used was um, in the Sermon on the Mount or during in that time period where Jesus is giving these ethical directives to his followers. He says, if someone strikes you on one, one cheek, turn the other cheek. And when we hear that in our culture, we just think like, well, if someone strikes you, just like like you said, lay over, just let him hit you again the other side of the face or whatnot. Uh, from what I've read, uh, you know, it seems clear that Jesus and in, in telling his disciples to operate in that way was actually being confrontational. <laughs> and so um, the understanding, I think, is, and again, I'm, you know, if a listener wants to correct me on this and do some deeper research, but like the Romans, um, it was seen as as uncouth to, you know, like, the, the hand that you use as an honorific, you know, to shake hands or whatever, uh, it wouldn't touch certain things. And so when a centurion, for instance, would maybe 
strike like one of the one of the Israelites, they would use the back of their hand. And so Christ by saying by saying turn the other cheek, he's saying, Well, like, will you strike me with the the front part of your hand? Now, even if that was invented or I read it and should have done deeper research, certainly Jesus is confronting the evildoer with the injustice that they've just perpetrated. So someone strikes you, the the immediate human pulse is to fight back. But or by, or run away. Or run away. By turning the other cheek, you're sort of you're sort of like over accepting the injustice and for them to strike you again, it's sort of like it, it shows to them right in front of their own faces, like the injustice that they're perpetrating all, like all of Jesus, like, at well, the, yeah. And that one, especially before you move on, just yeah. like, like fo- what he follows with always proves your point. You're right about this, right? So if someone makes you walk a mile, which again, that is like up front, I'm almost dead sure Roman policy, mm-hmm. right? Like any plebe would have to like, I think the law was something effective, like you must walk a mile with, the Romans armor. And so they go, make them, make them make you do the second one. Mm -hmm. Uh, Share more than the cloak they asked for. If they try to take your jacket, give them the shirt off your back, which would leave you naked. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're walking down the street naked. Uh, All of these, it's sort of like the idea in St. Paul of heaping burning coals upon someone's head. Like by returning um, anger with kindness, you heap burning coals upon their head. And so none of this is about being a doormat, but our, our Lord recognizes that, uh, fight fire with fire, like to try to fight the injustices and violence of the world on their own terms is to be implicated in the violence that they're perpetrating, but it's also ultimately ineffective. That's paradoxical, but all of the sort of like revolutionary movements that we revere today uh, were lasting precisely because they fought it on different terms. And so, bud, this is perfect. We're leading up to it. Jesus says, why am... Why can I lay my life down? This is especially in John. What, what does he say? I can lay my da- life down. Why? Because it's mine to lay down. One of the most important paradoxes in Christianity that I know we miss all the time is you can only sacrifice yourself if you are in possession of yourself. So the Philippian hymn, right? Why can Christ empty himself? Because he's God. And so he has the authority and the capacity to empty himself and to take on our wretchedness and expiate it through his sacrifice. All through John, he keeps pointing this out, right? Even up to the face of like speaking it to the face of Pilate, I could send legions of angels to stop you, but I don't because that's not what is in the the, the will of providence. I give myself up, not the people who are doing it to me. See, one of the seats of spiritual abuse, which is the darkest sort of kenosis or the most perverse element of it, is we take the Christian element, right, where we're supposed to be humble, uh, we're supposed to be willing to suffer with others, we're supposed to take on others' burdens, we're supposed to be penitential. And the perverse, bud, what do they do to spiritually abuse people? They take that fact and they weaponize it and victimize people And then when they say, you shouldn't be doing this to me, what do they say? Oh, you got to carry my burdens. You got to do these things like this, et cetera, et cetera. They do the dark kenosis. What's interesting, right, is so in the spiritual life, if you, you know, what are the, uh, the three ages of the spiritual life very classically are purgation, illumination, and then unification. And the idea is once you purge yourself of a life committed to sin, you can have the light of Christ illuminate the truth, and then you can unify yourself with God. But, but the interesting thing is purgation, in order for it to be purging, you have to claim yourself. You have to sort of be the one to make the purging. You can't go into someone else's house and throw away their stuff and say it's trash. The only way that you can declare something to be trash in your house, bud, is to claim it as yours. These are mine, and I'm removing them from myself. And so Christianity has a radical, at the beginning, self-possession that must occur. You must say, this is me, this is my sin, and this is not shame-driven. This is actually a moment of, it's not pride, what's the word that I'm looking for? Self-possession. Actually, the sin doesn't own me, the sin is mine. I give it away. I ask for forgiveness. I purgate myself. Now I ask for Christ to illuminate what I have emptied myself of, and now I will be filled and unified with him. 
That's how we make sure people who are not treated should not be treated like doormats. This is why it's important for neophytes, for instance, not to be run over uh, by wretched uh, spiritual fathers or mothers. That's why it's so important, right, that you have to graduate from spiritual milk to spiritual meat before you can make these big sacrifices. What Kristen's talking about is people at the very beginning of the neophyte phase of becoming a medical practitioner. They tell you to empty yourself so that you can be, if not abused, run over, filled with, you know, what, what happens when they, you clean the house and kick out the one demon, bud? Seven more come in. Yeah. And so the distinction between dark kenosis and the kenosis we're talking about is actually Christ was in full possession of himself, and that is why he could empty himself. And Christ wants you to be fully possessed of yourself so that you can sacrifice yourself. You are not supposed to let yourself get ran over, used up, run over, doormatted. Actually, the act of confession, when you confess, is an act of self-possession. You come in possession of yourself, then hand over the sin, and then the purification illumination comes from the penance. This is really helpful. I've actually, you've helped to answer my questions, and I, I'm, I'm sincere about that. It's not like I just lobbed some naive question to start this segment. But uh, when I think about this kind of rearguard action or the resistance that we're trying to generate, I think there are a couple ways, you know, based on what you're just sharing, that we can get at this. And the first is, so we've been using the language of traditions and what we've been trying to get at is even what we call like enlightenment philosophy or scientific rationality. It has a history with certain assumptions in place. And so part of it, the Alistair McIntyre, the philosopher that we've mentioned a couple of times, he talks about incommensurate traditions, meaning Christianity has certain ideas and assumptions that are incommensurate. They can't be squared with the sort of presuppositions that are operative in some other traditions. So when we think like on some level, when you hear that, you say like, well, the conversation's over. There's nothing left to talk about. But Bo, like you were saying, sometimes we have to express our disagreement in terms that the other side understands. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a matter of what you could, could call like out narrating the other side. So Kristen, in her article, at one point she writes, if medicine is no longer working from a divine anthropology like Christians have, what then happens when learners are given big terms and concepts that are important to patients in medicine, terms like justice, humane, dignity, compassion, ethics, or even person, modern medicine with only a mechanistic anthropology cannot possibly have any idea what those terms really mean because they are no longer rooted in the source that renders them intelligible concepts. So in some ways with modern medicine, we can get to the point where we can say these things that you're talking about, like justice or human dignity, could you explain to us how you reach those conclusions, right? And we kind of, there, there comes a point where like modern medicine sort of acts like the answers are obvious, but it's like, have you really been able to give a coherent reason why mm -hmm. we would say respect the dignity of each person, uh, whatever the concept has to be, the concepts that Kristen mentions. The other point, and this gets back to not being a doormat, is sometimes the conversation does break down and it seems like we've reached a dead end. We can't go any further. And that's where Christians have to go back to, I think, to things like witness and practice. And this is why it's so important that the Catholic Church has remained involved with medicine and education. Our hospitals, our healthcare facilities sometimes say, we're simply not going to do those things. And the world is like, you're nuts. Like, how can you have those commitments? And just through our witness or our way of life, we shine a light on the injustices that are taking place elsewhere. Here I think of, I've, I've pulled up a quote from uh, Stanley Hauerwas, who teaches at, taught at Duke, an ethicist who we both uh, deeply respect. He says, and he says this very bluntly, I'd say that in 100 years of Christians are people identified as those who do not kill their children or their elderly, we would have been doing something right. And so at the end of the day, like at some point we have to say, we're just, we're not going to do certain practices. We're not going to be involved in those things. We might be seen as crazy by those who are outside the church, but we'll, we'll be vindicated, I think, as Harawas indicates, by being those who are identified for those sorts of commitments. Man, I love the warp and weft of those conversations. They weave together well. There you go. Now, um, this is fantastic, but in, if I'm going to put a sort of nice, I, this, is, this is a topic that we will, we'll be talking about for a while. But for today, putting the cherry on top of this wonderful Sunday, I'll say ma machines cannot sacrifice themselves. Even when we say, oh, I, like I sacrifice that machine, what I mean is 
oh man, that thing I paid money for, like it's gone. Mm -hmm. But the machine can't offer itself up and that's why it can't pour itself out. So machines can have like their memory deleted or all sorts of things like this. Johnny five is alive. I'm making short circuit jokes now. So we really need to wrap this up. Uh, but what it, so that it can only have dark kenosis, right? It can be emptied of its capacity, its efficient and material cause. But because there's no final or formal cause in a machine, it cannot be an oblation. It can't be a sacrifice. We must be willing to do that. But in order to do that, we must take full possession of ourselves. Then we can empty ourselves out for others. And hopefully that's the distinction between uh, dark kenosis. <clears throat> Sorry. Hopefully that's the distinction between dark kenosis and the kenosis of Jesus Christ we should all hope to imitate. This is The Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner, Dr. Budmar, stick around. We'll be back right after this. Back with The Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner, Dr. Budmar, joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. It is wonderful to have you with us. Bud, we're running a tad bit long with the segments because it was such wonderful uh Grist for the mill <laughs> uh, to warp and weft all those together. But one more shout out, Dr. Kristen Collier, our good friend. Yeah. Uh, go to public discourse. The name of the article is. Oh, no, I've got to scroll up. It's I think it's just dark kenosis in medicine, right? <laughs> My screen paused right at the. Oh, no, no. The dark kenosis of medical education. Yeah, but public discourse. This is Witherspoon Institute. Yeah. Uh, Kristen, if you're listening, thank you so much for. The wonderful article that I hope everyone reads and takes to heart, but particularly uh, thank you for allowing us to really chomp into this idea and really clarify, bud, hopefully some of the things we brought up. And as you said, I think this article has helped us start to navigate how exactly our understanding of sacrifice doesn't get yeah. kidnapped and hijacked to use for spiritual abuse leadership abuse, doormatting of people, etc. Yeah, I'm really glad you proposed this article as a point of discussion today. I think about modern uh, medical education. It needs to have this discussion so badly. We know working in that orbit, there's all sorts of talk about burnout on the part of healthcare professionals. And even that language of burnout, it's, it's presenting or framing the human person. It's fam framing our healthcare professionals as sort of machines. Like historically, I don't know. In the middle middle ages, they talked about human beings burning out. Anyways, that's a conversation just for an, burning. That's just a whole burning. Different, yeah, yeah. <laughs> conversation for another day. In terms of um, some housekeeping things, if you do want to join us in our prayer life here at I Iowa Catholic Radio, we pray the Rosary on air at six a.m. and ten a.m. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy at two fifty-five in the afternoon. And you can use the Iowa Catholic Radio app to pray the rosary anytime, anywhere. And if you want to make sure to go to iowacatholicradio.com and look at events, you can see what's happening in and around the Iowa Catholic Radio listening area. For instance, February 18th through 19th at 3 p.m. and then 7 p.m. It's uh, Hanson Hall in, at St. Malachi in Madrid, Iowa. Anthony Digman, February 26th in the Tea Room. Forge presents an evening with Ralph Martin, uh, founder and CEO of Renewal Ministries. So that will be something I know. Um, people here in Des Moines, uh, I've heard them talk about him. So there you go. 7 p.m. Go figure that one out. Uh, March 1st, uh, West Des Moines, first Friday mass. Oh, uh, uh, I think at Iowa Catholic Radio. That's Oh, yeah, at the Celebration of the Holy uh, Mass at the Chapel of St. Gabriel, the Archangel at Iowa Catholic Radio. They snuck that one up on us, bud. That's pretty yeah. cool. March 9th at Cedar Rapids at St. Pius the 10th Church, Archdiocese of Dubuque's Men's Conference, April 12th in Altoona, St. John and Paul, uh, Peter uh, Herbick will be out there. May 9th, the Legacy Golf Club, the Iowa Catholic... Oh, Radio Golf Classic, Ooh. bud. Whew, we got to go. They better not cheat us this year. I think one <laughs> year we were actually not the last place team. I think they just have like a plaque that has us oh. as last place no matter they what. They want to re-engrave it. That's right. June 22nd, <laughs> West Des Moines, uh, Iowa Catholic uh, Radio Family Night. So that's another one that they're going to be setting up here soon. Folks, this ministry is not just the people you hear on air or behind the desks or behind the computers. It is your ministry as well. Please make sure to donate to Iowa Catholic Radio as we come into uh, the spring. 515-223-1150 uh, to call. Or you can donate at iowacatholicradio.com or the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Bud, 
Fantastic show as always. Yeah, blessings. Have a great week. This is the Uncommon Good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, family, city, state, nation, solar system, galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is the Uncommon Good. We'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.